You can turn with me in your Bibles to Romans 12. We're going to talk about something kind of hard today. And so before we jump off on that topic, I want to clear something up before we do this. There's what I call balance of truth. And one of the things Satan loves to do is get us out of balance. If someone breaks into your house, what are you called to do as a Christian? That's easy, Pastor. Shoot them. No, no, no. (laughs) You're to appeal to the authority that God has put in place to protect you. So you call 911. If they don't get there in time to protect you and you have the means, what are you to do? Dennis is, we got to pray for Dennis. He just starts shoot him. <laughs> you are called to protect your family. That is not avenging. That is not getting revenge. That is protecting. If someone does something criminal against you as a Christian, do you take them to court? Yes. If a Christian does something against you criminal, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to take it to church and, and the Christians are supposed to work it out. But God has put certain things in place to protect us. And so we are called to protect. We're stewards of things God has given us. And so I am not talking about those types of things today. I am talking about when people do things that presses our buttons, and we want to pay back. I heard something great, and they know who it is, and I never thought of it, and I'm so glad God did not reveal it to me until after I gave my life to Christ, because I'd have done it. I have a little road rage problem. I don't know why people like to drive slow in the left lane, but they do. We've got a state law. Obey your governing authorities, people. If you're driving, you're supposed to be in the right lane unless you're passing someone. So anyway, I was listening to, we went to the movies the other night. I didn't ask permission, and I'm not going to throw this person under the bus. But we were talking about uh, he was being tailgated by somebody, just riding up on him for five miles. And he said, I was just about to go off, cut off the road so it would hit all that gravel and kick rocks and stuff on their car. I went, huh. (laughs) Now we laugh because we can relate to that. There is something in us that wants justice. And part of that is the image of God, but our sin nature twists it. And Paul is about to tell us how to love those people. He's told us how to love God, how to love the church and operate in the church. And now he's going to talk about how we're to conduct ourselves out here with people that are hostile to us. And so before we begin, we're going to pray that we will not be in the flesh, but be in the spirit. So let's, uh, let's pray. Father, you give us some great wisdom, but it is very hard to practice apart from your spirit within us. We are built knowing there's a right and wrong. Your law is written on our hearts. And when we see injustice, when we feel wronged, often we want to take matters into our own hands, and yet you have given us a tremendous, tremendous responsibility to love as Christ does. And we cannot do that on our own. That is not something we can manifest on our own. That's not something we can dutifully, (laughs) willfully do. Because you even looked at the motives of our heart. So even when we are not executing the wrath we want, we're thinking about it. And so, Father, I pray that you would help us to empty ourselves and allow you to fill us with your spirit that we can love the way you call us to. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. There's a book called Irregular Persons. It's written by Joyce Landorf. It contends that everybody has an irregular person in their life. Now, the book is geared toward family members, but it talks more than that. Irregular persons are those people that have a knack to press your buttons. 
They know exactly the wrong thing to say to ruin your whole day. When you see them coming, you know they're going to suck all the life right out of you and leave skipping away. They anger you. They emotionally tax you out. As much as you try to love them, they just ruin you. And uh, she says, every one of us has that person in our life. And then she says, and you're an irregular person to somebody else as well. We go, no, pastor, not me. Yes, you. (laughs) We all kind of rub each other. There are people that make life hard, and they tend to enjoy it. And sadly, some of them are unaware that they even do it. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Amen or oh me? These people often have been hurt. They have control issues or insecurity, or they're just willful and selfish, and they wreck a lot of things. They bring suffering. They're the people that kind of are the drama makers. Uh, They hurt. And sadly, some of them do it as sport. They enjoy it. They do. How many of you know some of those people? Raise your hand. How are we as Christians supposed to deal with them? Don't answer, Dennis. (laughs) We're not supposed to shoot them. We're not. Um, It's a hard list. And um, what God is saying is our Christian love should be independent on people's reaction to us and what they do to us. We cannot do what we're about to talk about unless you are filled with the love of God. You cannot do it. I don't care what anybody says. Because our motive is there's a sense of payback. We just are wired that way. If I'm hurt, I'm going to make them what? Some of us do this. Oh, you know what? They think they're getting over. I'm just going to wear them down. Because that's how I do life. And I win. They're the same type of people. We all do it different. It's impossible apart from Christ and abiding in Him and resting in Him to do this. Matter of fact, Paul has already talked about this. In Romans 5, 5, he says this, Because God's love has been abundantly poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. And so he's calling us to love with the capacity that Christ has. It is easy for us to love people that are easy to love. Amen or oh me? Somebody gave me peeps. I don't know who it is, but I'm going to hug them. Why? They love on me, I'm going to love back on them. That's easy. Don't get me any more peeps. I'm working out. (laughs) But I love me some peeps. They're going to die today. (laughs) They are. We have a hard time loving people who are hard to love. And God calls us to that. And so, if you will look with me at Romans 12, starting at verse 14, we're using the Amplified Version. It says, bless those who persecute you, who cause you harm or hardship. Bless and do not curse them. Now, God is not talking about this. Bless your heart. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the people that hurt us, wrecked us, ruined us. We are to pray blessings on them. We're to ask God to show his favor on them. To show himself strong on their behalf. Now, Paul, whenever he does this, he says, don't do this, but do this. He's going to do this throughout the rest of this chapter. And so he wants us to bless those who persecute you. And he reiterates it. Bless and do not curse them. Look at verse 15. This is something Christians struggle with too. Rejoice with those who rejoice, sharing others' joys, and weep with those who weep, sharing others' grief. Live in harmony with one another. Agape love sympathizes with others. We are called as Christians to enter the emotions of other people. And that is hard too. Everything Paul's going to say at the end of this chapter is hard. 
it's easy for us. I was sitting with a family yesterday that their, their father passed away. I've got a funeral tomorrow. 90 years old. He was up under a truck a couple of weeks ago just working. He moved an engine by himself with a tractor and was trying to put it in a car by him. Just fit as a fiddle. But his heart gave out. He was one of the best dads on the planet. And, and those three children were weeping and grieving. And when that's going on, that's easy for me to feel that. And it was really easy because I've lost a father. So now I know what that really feels like. We're called to do that with everything, whether they're weeping for dad or a pet. One of the first calls I got as a pastor of this church was to do a funeral for a lab. Now, let me tell you what I didn't do. God has not called me to lower myself down to that level, bury that dog. I can't believe you've called me for that. You weep with those who are weeping. We had a funeral service for the lab. And I wept with them because that lab was family. You say, Pastor, that's ridiculous. <coughs> no, it's not, because God calls us to that. To weep with those who are weeping, sharing others' grief. I think we have a hard time rejoicing with those who rejoice. We really do. You've been at the business for 10 years, and you've got a coworker who's been there for 10 years, and you go in for your review and they give you a dollar raise and you're excited and your coworker comes out and goes, five dollar raise, did you get it? <laughs> Do you rejoice with those who are rejoicing? Do you go, man, that's great. Man, I'm so happy for you. No, we don't. We go, what? <laughs> and God calls us to be different. We're to high five and to celebrate and go, God, thank you for my dollar raise. And thank you for blessing Chuck with his five. Because we're not omniscient. We don't know all things. He may have a hardship that boss knows about, and he may have terminal cancer, and they're trying to help him before he steps off into it. I don't know that. So we're to rejoice. We're to weep. And Christians sometimes don't do that and they have a hard job understanding where people are, and they can't relate to real hardships because we don't get emotionally entangled. Does that make sense? God calls us to do that. Look what else he says. Well, let me, tell you, let me share this before I jump off that bridge. I'm praying. Sometimes Christians can be the most insensitive people in the world because we're more concerned about being right than loving. We're to be both. And last week I talked about pride, how we're filled with it. So if as I'm speaking, you're secretly saying in your heart, preach it to them, brother. You've got the same problem because you can't relate to them. God calls us to really relate to each other where they're at. One of the reasons people come to me is not because I'm so smart and so brilliant, but for two things. And the reason I'm saying this is because they've told me, you listen and you what? Understand. And sometimes I don't understand, but I try to weep. I try to rejoice. When Jesus was at the graveside of Lazarus and he died, did Jesus know what was going to happen? Did he know he was going to say, Lazarus, come forth? Did he know there's going to be great joy and happiness? What did he do there before that happened? He wept. Say that louder. Jesus wept. It is. Only in the English, not in the Greek. There's a shorter verse in the Greek. He related to where they were. He did that a lot. And we're to, we're to do that too. He says, do not be haughty. Six things the Lord hates, seven are detestable to him. Number one is a haughty look. Thinking we're better, we know better, we understand better. We're wiser, we're smarter, that's haughty. 
Do not be haughty or conceited or self-important or exclusive. Listen to this. But associate with humble people. The Amplified breaks that Greek down for you. Those with a realistic self-view of themselves, if you will. Do not overestimate yourself. How do you know if you're overestimating yourself? Ask some lost people. They'll tell you. They use words like this. They're fake. They're not real. They think they're better. They're prideful. You can hear it how they talk. I get a weird vibe around them. God wants us very what? Humble. God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. We're supposed to help one another. Sometimes, sometimes not. But we've got to be humble enough to hear the truth. Verse 17, never repay anyone evil for evil. Never ride off the side of the road to kick up rocks. (laughs) Take thought for what is right and gracious and proper in the sight of everyone. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Evil is done to us and we react to it. I shared this story before, I'm going to share it again. There was a lady that was coming into a fast food line. She got in the fast food line and she unintentionally cut somebody off. And that person behind hit the horn, gave some sign language, and even bumped the bumper. And so this lady, when she gets up to the cash window, says, I want to pay for my meal, but I want to pay for the one behind me as well. You sure? I'm positive. And she takes, she said, I want both receipts, and she took both receipts. She went to the food window, and she said, "Um, I paid for one meal, but I ordered an extra one. Can you give me that one too? And she took both of them and drove off. (laughs) Now listen, there's a part of us, y'all are laughing hard. You know why? There's a part of us that goes, yes, yes. Listen, is that stuff fun? Thank you. Someone's telling the truth. Yes, it is. That's why we laugh so hard. There's a part of us that goes, yes. But there's also a part of us that knows if you're filled with the Spirit, that is not right. And that is why God says this. He gives you the don't. Never repay anyone evil for evil. Take thought for what is right, gracious, and proper in the sight of everyone. If possible, now notice it says if possible because there's some people it's impossible to live at peace. Both parties have to be willing to want peace, to have it. But if one person says, you got to do this, 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 and then I'll have peace, they're not looking for peace. They're looking for their way. There's times that we're to lay down our life and and try our best to live at peace, but I want you to know sometimes it's not going to happen because some people will not let it happen. We're to pursue peace. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. And so God says, when that happens, take thought of what's right and gracious and proper in the sight of everyone, and if possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace, because love is patient, and love is kind. Verse 19, beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave the way open for God's wrath, his judicial righteousness. For it is written in Scripture, vengeance... Now listen to this. God is speaking, and it's a promise. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. 
do not overcome or conquer by evil, but overcome evil with good. With good. Never take revenge. Listen, a wounded animal is dangerous. If you're hunting a mountain lion or a bear and you've wounded it and you're in the woods with it, you're in trouble. It's cornered. It's gonna, and wounded people are worse. They want to punish other people. God says, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. A wounded person will take both your eyes and your head. They will not stop at an eye. If they punch you and take a tooth, they're going to punch all your teeth out because that's how I roll. That's the kingdom of darkness. And God says, I want you not to overcome evil with evil. I want you to give place, if you will, leave a way open for God's wrath. Is vengeance fun? Yes, it is. Don't lie. Is it satisfying? In the moment, yes, yes, it is. Is, does it make you feel powerful? Make you feel right? Yeah, it does. But there's always a price tag. The verse they quote for marriages is not really for marriages. And I tried to apply it in my marriage when I first got married and realized that wasn't the verse and it doesn't apply here. You ready for it? You're going to laugh. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down in your anger. I learned something in my marriage. If my wife's angry, she's going to go to sleep. And I may be up all night and get up the next morning. She's still not talking. What that verse is referring to is something very, very dangerous. It says, in your anger, it's Ephesians 4, verse 26. In your anger, do not sin. You're going to get angry. Is anger a sin? No. 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 If it was, we're in trouble because Jesus got angry. Jesus used force. Jesus confronted. It says, do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. You need to work it out. And do not give the devil a foothold. Because when you're angry like that, you're giving Satan a foothold. And what will happen is bitterness will sprout up. Self-righteousness will kick in. And you'll be consumed by your anger. And you'll feel you won't get any peace until you what? Pay back. The problem is when we pay back, payback comes back on, on us. Vengeance is mine. I will repay. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome and conquer by evil, but overcome evil with good. There's a lot of speculation what that heap of burning coals means. It actually comes from an old Egyptian tradition where you were contrite and broken and showing publicly that you were grieving, that you had done wrong, that you had regret, that you were ashamed, a way of humbling yourself. The Jews would put on sackcloth and ashes, or they'd rip their clothes and fall face down on the ground. And what this verse is talking about is we as Christians are to return good, to bring about shame. Let me explain what I mean. I work for a very reputable company and I was young, I was in my 20s and I was always five minutes late. Always. I could blame traffic, I could blame whatever I wanted to, but the truth of the matter is I should have got there what? Early. But I'm learning to adult and you know, it was just hard. And I get there one day, and my boss says, you know what, you can go home today. I said, well, I'm, I'm here. I know you're here. You're here late. Go home. Fire flew into me. The wrath of Larry wanted to pour out on his car. 
But I'm a Christian now, so I go home and I'm praying about it on the way home and God starts to change my heart and then I realize something. Who was wrong? You. Me. Well, that was overkill. No, it wasn't. It's his right. I'm to obey my authorities. I'm to submit. I'm doing my work as unto the Lord. So I go home, I'm reading my Bible, God convicts me, and then he did the worst thing to me. He said, you need to go back and what? Oh, oh I have to humble myself. And so I go there, and I did this. I said, hey, Bill, I need to talk to you. I was mad when I left here. I left in a way I should not have. And I am sorry. And I'll work better on getting here early. What happened in that moment is he humbled himself. And said, well, I was having a bad day, and I kind of overreacted on you, and I'm sorry. And from that day on, we were, but I could have done this. Hey, I went home and looked up the legal laws in Virginia, and what you did yesterday is illegal, and my lawyer's going to be calling you, and you're going to have it coming. (laughs) I'm going to quit today, and I'm going to get a severance package, too. That's what my lawyer said. What does that do to him, to me? Escalates it. We do not overcome evil with evil. We do it by being good. And what that does is it often humbles and shames the other person. You see this in the Bible. Y'all been studying the the ladies' Bible class on, on, gosh, what, Tuesdays? Thursdays, thank you. Y'all study David and Saul. Saul is pursuing David, trying to kill David. He slandered David. He hates David. He's trying to get David. And praise God, David is filled with God's spirit because what happens is the guy that's been trying to kill David and his men walk into the cave to use the bathroom. He walks back into the cave, unaware David and his men are over here, and he goes to relieve himself. And David's men are good Baptists. This is what David's men said. God has given him into your hands. Kill him! Or as Dennis English would say, shoot him! (laughs) David, being filled with God's spirit, knew what God's word says and said, I will not raise my hand against the Lord's anointed. He knew that went against God's word. But what he did do is snuck up on him, took his knife out and cut the corner of his robe off and snuck back. Saul goes out with his men who are seeking to kill David. And David comes out the cave with that cloth and goes, Saul! He sees the fabric. He recognizes the fabric. I'm sure Saul did one of these. And he saw it. He saw what was missing. He said, I could have killed you. This is Larry's message. Paraphrase real. Could have killed you. I didn't. Basic scripture said, the Lord delivered you into my hands today. And I did not return evil for evil. That's really what's taking place there. Do you know what Saul's response was to David in that moment? He wept aloud. And he said, you are more righteous than I am. You have treated me well, but I have treated you badly. You have just now told me about the good you did to me. The Lord delivered me into your hands, but you did not kill me. When a man finds his enemy, does he let him get away unharmed? May the Lord reward you well for the way you treated me today. I know that you will surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel be established by your hands. Now swear to me by the Lord that you will not kill off my descendants or wipe out my name from my father's family. And David made that commitment and he kept it. That's heaping coals on the head. It was able to bring them to a place of repentance and humbleness, and they connect. That's what we're called to do as Christians across the board. Not talking about protecting, I'm talking about when we're wronged. 
when we're slandered, when we're lied about. And listen, is that easy or hard? It's hard. hard. Jesus demonstrates this for us, and we're to imitate Christ. Peter, talking about Jesus, says, For if we, while we were God's enemies, that's what God referred to us before we gave our life to Christ, because we just <laughs> violated everything God's asked us to do. An enemy is somebody who's antagonistic towards you. That's the dictionary definition of an enemy. For while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? That's Romans 5.10, but this is what Peter says how Jesus handled that. He did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. That's why vengeance is God's, because he judges justly. We don't. We don't know everything. We think we do, but we don't. I had somebody come to me the other day, and he was just sharing about some things. He said, you know, why is this church not letting them do this and do that? I said, because they're living in grievous sin. It'd be unloving to enable that. Why would you do that? Well, I don't think God would want that. God's word says it right here. Read it. Oh, I didn't what? No. But see, they assume they knew. They're wrong. You're right. No, wait. We don't know everything. God judges justly. And God demonstrates his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So how do we do this? Let me give you three things. Write this down because it is hard. The first thing you need to do is pray for you. God, change my heart. God, fill me with your love so I can love as you love. God, would you, would you help me to understand I'm not as smart as I think. I don't know everything. Help me to entrust myself to who? Mm -hmm. To you. Then you pray for that person. You pray for them. That changes your heart. C.S. Lewis said prayer doesn't change God. Prayer changes us, and there's some truth to that statement. When the girl's mother, um, that we, you know, of our foster daughters, she was doing some horrific things, and I was praying like the country song prays. I pray a flower pot falls out a window and hits her in her head, and the brakes go out in her car going downhill, because I wanted what? Justice and vengeance. God, can you just make this happen? And I was listening to a sermon, and it was about pray for your enemies. I'll read you the verse. Have you heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy? But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be, that you may be like the children of your Father in heaven. He goes on to explain. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of things against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. It's an opportunity. So I started praying for their mother. And something really bizarre started to happen. I fell in love with her. You ask her today, does Larry love you? She will say yes. She got upset one day and we were at our house and and she started crying, and, and I just kind of held her. I love her like a daughter, my enemy. See, that's what happens when we do it God's way. And then I started praying, God, would you help her to come to know you? Would you help her to come to Christ? Can you send somebody in her life to share Christ with you so she can have the forgiveness and all that you've given me? And guess what? Somebody comes in her life, and they start going where? Church. Church. We start by praying for ourselves. We pray for them. This is the hard one. And we entrust ourselves to God. 
We entrust ourselves to God. We have to trust that God will get vengeance. Now, we're to do legally what we're responsible for. We're to pursue justice that way. But we entrust all of it to who? God. I heard a great story. I'm going to close with it because this is how God works sometimes. There's a guy that was going to be flying. It was a long flight. And he gets on the plane. He looks at his ticket. And there's a man sitting in his seat. He's by the window. The two seats are empty. He goes to the man and says, excuse me, sir, you're sitting in my seat. He said, you can sit somewhere else. You're not sitting here. He said, but this is my ticket. I don't care. And the battle of willfulness began. He's saying, I have the right. I've got the ticket. I paid for this seat. I don't care if you paid for it or not. The stewardess said, sir, would you please get up? I'm not getting up. Started to get to contentious. So she turned to the ticket holder and said, would you mind just sitting over here? And he gave up. Our culture says he's a loser. He let that guy walk all over him. Now listen, he entrusted, he's a Christian. He entrusted himself to God. He's hurt. He's angry. He wants justice. So he went and sat down. Now I don't know if you've ever flown, but if there's empty seats, sometimes some things happen. And it did. A mother and a (laughs) three-year-old. Come in late. They put them in that seat, and the kid sits right next to the guy that's by the window with the laptop. And it's no no ordinary three-year-old. It's an inquisitive three-year-old. What's that? Is that a computer? I heard about computers. Is that a laptop? Is, I, my mother didn't have a laptop. She's got a desktop. But I really, we really wish we had a laptop. So you, can you play games on that? Do you have any games on that? For the whole flight. The guy is sitting there looking, taking delight. Now be careful because Proverbs says don't take delight when God does that. He'll stop it. He's trying to shape hearts. He's trying to do things. And so... All the passengers are seeing this, and the kid is a little, a little annoying. And then all of a sudden, they stop. Quiet. People look, and that little child is white as a ghost. Air sick. When they got off the plane, true story, when they got off the plane, the stewardess told the guy who had to give up his seat, she said, and so he waited. Waited till everybody got off. She came over, poured some champagne, and they chinged. (laughs) And as the person telling the story is, they celebrated the righteousness of God. Now listen, We would like to see it happen that fast. Does it happen? Yes. All the time. If we give God room. God makes a promise. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I'll wait until you get heaven to pay them back. Is that what he says? Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Hopefully it may work out. Is that what he says? Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will Repay. Let me tell you what he did to me. I grew up as a player. Did I not? A player. I hurt a lot of girls. Purposely sometimes. For sport. I give my life to Christ. We work with a college and career ministry for 12 years. And then when I get married... We have two what? And I got to live as a father to two girls that got played by players. Oh, wait, God didn't stop there. I have a little granddaughter. Every pet we had has been girls. And then, for whatever reason, and listen, I really do believe God does this. For the last couple of years, been helping girls who've been devastated by 
players. Do you think God doesn't break my heart? Do you think God doesn't go, you see, Larry? Do you know how many of those girls I've apologized to? All but three. One wouldn't let me. I can't find the other two. Why did I go and apologize to them? Because I understood. My eyes were open. That's how God's vengeance works. We like to slit tires and throw eggs on cars. God says, my ways are higher than your ways. And when we give room for God to do it, he does a far better job. We may never see it this side of heaven, but I promise you, it is happening. Why? God says, I will repay. And he judges justly because he knows all the facts. You know, one of the hardest things about being a pastor is I know more facts about things than other people do, and I have to sit there objectively and listen to things. I say, oh, if you only knew the rest of the story. If you knew all the facts, you wouldn't be doing what you're doing right now. But I can't break a what? It's hard. We need to trust who? God. If you're here today, I want you to think about something before we leave. How am I doing on time, Nancy? Good. Good. I heard two people say this this week. I think God is paying me back for the sins I've done. They're right. God has paid them back, but not the way they think. Jesus paid for the sins you've done. God is not looking to get you back. He poured all his judgment on Christ. And I'm thankful that Christ didn't do what we do. Can you imagine reading your Bible? And they mocked him and spit upon him. And Jesus spitting back said, He didn't retaliate. He didn't fight back. When they were mocking him and God, you know what he said? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And your enemy may be the same way. And because he entrusted himself to God and did what God asked him to do, he has made a way for us so that we can connect with God the Father. Because he took all the punishment we were supposed to get. Vengeance was poured on him. Revenge, if you will, was poured on him. God's wrath was poured on him so it didn't have to be poured on us. And God is just asking us, church, to be the same way. Be the Christ-like figure in a world full of vengeance. Is that easy? And that's why for Lent we need to be praying for everybody's what? Heart. God, change our heart. Let's pray. Father, there's people in this room that have been traumatized by sadistic people. There's people in this room that have been hurt and it has wrecked their entire life. And Father, I pray that you would just touch them in a special way today and help restore their soul. (coughs) Father, I know I struggle with wanting to pay those people back as well. But Father, I pray that you would help us not only to entrust them to you, that you would repay them back in a right and just and holy way. But for those that are struggling so, and you know who they are, I pray that one day they could get a glimpse of how you worked on their behalf for justice. I pray they would not delight in it, but they would praise you for being a good God. Father, I thank you for stories like a three-year-old sitting next to a stubborn man. 
You bring that discipline into our life to humble us so we can be drawn to you, to teach us lessons. And Father, we forget that we're that person to somebody else as well. So help us to love one another. Help us to trust you. Help us not to return evil for evil, but to allow you space to work in a mighty way to bring correction. Father, just do a great work with your people here. And may your love fall down here as it's falling down other places that we could get a sense of your presence. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, Amen. 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 We're going to close with Jesus paid it all. And if you're here today and say, you know what, I, I need to give my life to Christ. I'm not where I should be. Uh, you grab me. You come up here. You humble yourself. Come up here. God won't resist you. Grab me after service. But you do what the Lord leads you to do. Let's stand and sing this as we leave today.